Hello everyone, tuning into the Bear Cam at explore.org. My name is Andrew. I'm a park ranger here at Katmai National Park and Preserve, and we will be doing a live chat momentarily. Please stick with us. I'll be joined by Ranger Russ here on the Riffles platform on the Brooks River. Are you good? All right. Good well, morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to another live chat. We are here at Katmai National Park and Preserve, about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage on the Alaskan Peninsula. Uh, this uh, chat is brought to you in conjunction with Explore.org. Uh, this is a partnership uh, we at Katmai National Park have done with Explore.org since 2012. My name is Andrew. My name is Russ. And we are both, both park rangers here uh, here in Katmai, and we are broadcasting today from the Riffles platform uh, on the Brooks River, uh, just a little bit of ways from Brooks Falls, uh, famous waterfall seeing bears catch the salmon in abundance this time of year. Absolutely, lots of salmon coming up the river, and this year we'll be celebrating our centennial. Yeah, it's an extra special time to tune into the bear cams, uh, see what activity is going on. It's our 100th birthday. Uh, first founded in 1918 by President Woodrow Wilson to protect not necessarily the bears or the mm -hmm. salmon, but actually the amazing geology of that we Valley have here in smokes. Katmai. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Nova Rupta was the fifth largest volcanic eruption in recorded history and the largest of the 20th century. Yeah, quite an amazing place. So today we'll be doing a live chat. That's right. And our format will be sort of an interview uh, format today where I'll be talking with Andrew and uh, we'll be talking a lot in the beginning, yeah. uh, and then after that, we'll begin taking your questions. So yes. we look forward to those. So if you do have questions that arise uh, on today's topic, uh, you can comment them uh, there in the live chat section. We will have folks from explore.org who are feeding us these questions, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can in the second half of this broadcast. You can also ask us questions about anything else. That's right. Uh, what we ate for breakfast this morning. Um, <laughs> other bear activity. What's going on with the salmon? Uh, feel free to comment those uh, in the comment section uh, here on explore.org and we'll get to those for the second half. That's right. Um, but today we are be talking about claws, paws, and teeth. Hmm. The finer points, Great. as we say. Uh -huh. uh, and Russ, when we think about bears sort of in the popular imagination, when you think about wilderness, uh, we often think, you know, there's this stereotype, uh, this trope out there about the menacing, scary brown bear or grizzly bear. Right. And when we think of these animals, that's often what we think of, right? True. Uh, these claws, sharp claws, and fangs, right? That's right. People get that in the imagination and have been doing that for centuries even. Right. Uh, but they're actually pretty fascinating, well-adapted tools. Uh, they are. These, yeah. I mean, these bears are amazingly designed, and with their claws, paws, and teeth, we think of them like weapons, but really they're more, you could look at them like tools. For example, sometimes in Yellowstone I've seen bears going through a field of yarrow yeah. looking for the roots, and you think of these claws as something that they're going to attack with, but really they're great digging implements, right? right. They're, they're using them as tools more than weapons. Far more than just weapons, for example. They are tools for survival. Right. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And we can start by talking about these paws, these massive footprints mm -hmm. that these bears have. I have a few props here. So many people don't realize that a bear track is not just a bear track. Uh, all four paws are not the same. Bears have hind paws, and they have their four paws. So when we're walking down the road here in Brooks Camp, you'll often see tracks. You will see these rounder, shorter four paws. So these are the ones in the front. That's right. And then these longer, almost by solid margin, longer. Definitely. 
hind paws. You can see the entire pad hitting the ground there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know how easy it is to tell the scale of this. This would be probably an adult, I would say maybe male brown bear. This is on the, on the larger yeah, side. Probably 800 pounds, maybe something like that, looking at that print. In comparison to human head, it's <laughs> quite large. I mean, we're talking almost close to a foot long in, with these claws. Right. Um, and these paws are going to be covered in a very thick skin on the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, incredibly tough. Right. Because uh, you think about everything that these bears have to walk through and go through on a daily basis as they're walking through the wild. Uh, they're not going to have, you know, Nike sneakers they could be using, uh, tennis shoes. They're going to be walking over some really rough terrain repeatedly day in, day out for the duration of their lives. That's right. Uh, and so these feet are going to get callous pretty quickly. It's very tough skin, almost like sandpaper. You know, and... You Seeing these prints really is something. Uh, I was in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes yeah. a couple weeks ago and fortunately had put my food cache, my uh, bear resistant container, uh, well away from the tent. And in the morning, a bear had come down and checked it out. And we knew because we saw these enormous prints all around the food container. We were very thankful that it didn't come to check the tent out and that we had kept our food really far away. But just seeing the prints alone let you know that it was a really Their large Their presence bear. is here. It's, yeah. uh, for folks who don't know, the Valley 10,000 Smokes is a very desolate looking sort of menacing volcanic valley here in the park. Um, mm -hmm. It was the original reason, reason this park was created. But even out there, with no close food sources, yep. they're moving through the area. They are. Uh, I also love that story just because uh, it is illustrative of the fact that we should keep our food well away from our sleeping quarters when we're camping in the backcountry because these bears are everywhere. Uh, so we have uh, these four paws. Uh, again, they're going to have these pretty significant claws on the end of it. And the claws will actually be longer on the front paws, on the four paws, mm -hmm. than they will in the, in the back. And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be a little bit later. Okay. Uh, but you can think about things like digging. This is what they're sort of their hands. If we're going to anthropomorphize it, the front paws are going to be the hands. They're going to be using right. that more as a tool as opposed to their feet, which would be the back paws, the hind paws. All right. And uh, a question we, we get yeah. a lot. How come the bears with, with these big feet why are they not falling over the Absolutely. falls a lot? So we have the hind paws and the fore paws, and bears are what we call plantigrade, mm. just like humans. They're okay. plantigrade. And that means that they have basically four points of contact with the ground, and they're stepping with the flat of their feet. Okay. And contrast that with what we call digitigrade which is something like a wolf, for example, mm -hmm. where they're walking on their digits, okay. hence the word digit grade. Uh, they're basically walking on their toes. Bears, in contrast, are going to be walking on the flats of their feet, which gives them additional stability, particularly being as heavy as they are. They, they need all that. They need to be able to support themselves and mm -hmm. be stable, uh, especially you know, later in the year here, they got pretty hefty bellies. By walking on the flats of their feet, uh, it gives them a little, just a little bit more stability. Whereas you think about something like other carnivores, like a wolf, for example, they want speed as well. They right. want agility. So while bears can move very fast, very fast, they can move about 50 yards in three seconds, we say here That's in our right. bear safety orientations. 30, 35 miles an hour. They're really designed more for stability and being steady being planted like on the falls. On the lips of the falls. And that really is, uh, you can see that in action. So when a bear will be standing on the lip of the falls, almost you know, precariously close to the edge, mm -hmm. they have a couple of things working in their favor. That planted grade stance. Yep. Uh, they're walking on the flats of their feet, so it gives them a little bit more stability. Instead of us, it has two points of contact, they have four. Which is gonna help a lot. They also have their sheer weight. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they have those long gripping claws too on all four paws. Uh, and the skin, as we mentioned on, the, on those paws, is gonna be quite abrasive. It gives them quite a bit of friction to help grip onto those rocks. 
And even so, we've seen a couple bears go over this year. Memorably, yes. I think there's a highlight video on explore.org of 409 taking a very quick tumble. We've also had a sub-adult or two uh, come over the lip of the falls. And that one time 409 went over the falls, it was like Grazer was right there. She didn't she didn't nudge her, yes. but she was really close. And as soon <laughs> She as didn't try to rescue her. So we had 128 <laughs> and 409 sort of on the lip. Yeah. 128 just saw 409 go over and, and just said, I'll take that spot. Swooped right in. Just yeah. took right a, great advantage of that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and then something I think is also very fascinating is if you look at the bone structure of these bear paws, in certain circumstances, particularly uh, after they've been used for taxidermy when they lose their claws, mm -hmm. they look eerily similar to a human hand. Uh, and I have uh, another prop here. If you found one in the woods, you might wonder. So I don't know similar. how well uh, this will be able to come through on camera. If uh, camera jo cameraman Josh can zoom in on this, but this is an image of a bear paw, a black bear paw specifically. This is from a document uh, put together by our friends in the Fish and Wildlife Service. And often, law not often, but from time <laughs> to time, law enforcement might get calls from people, you know, at construction sites or out in the wild, people thinking that they've come across a human appendage. Uh, bear paws. Uh, like the human hand, have three phalanges after the knuckle. Uh, so it sort of looks like human fingers. Sure does. Uh, particularly, again, if these have been used for taxidermy and people come across these body parts later in whatever setting. Right. It can be quite uh, a disturbing discovery. Think people ever mistake that for Sasquatch? A Sasquatch? That would be the other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a photo. Yes. Uh, they might. <laughs> this is a decomposing black bear paw. Um, but again, after the claws have been removed, as they often are for taxidermy, it doesn't look dissimilar from it, uh, the hands that we have it's true. on looks, our person. It's pretty close. Um, so I just thought that was very interesting. From the Fish and Wildlife Service, they put that together. Uh, but these claws, talk about these claws okay. for a second. Sure. So these are not short, dainty fingernails. These no. are not the claws that your household dog might have no. at home. These are going to be pretty hefty. Um, bear claws, is particularly on the front paw, mm -hmm. they will be longer on the forepaw than they are on the hind paw. And on an adult bear, they could be two to three inches. And they stand out. When you, know, you see the bears here, you notice the claws all the time. And they are almost a half an inch wide. Mm -hmm. So they have these large sort of, you know, bones sticking out of their paws. Uh, quite menacing looking. Um, but they're not, as we talked about at the front, they're used for much more than defense, which they can be used for. And um, I've even seen a bear, like last year Grazer had a sub-adult that was coming up towards her yeah. trying to join the family, it appeared. Yeah. Grazer went Hang to... Hang out with the, the <laughs> sow and her cubs. Yeah, and she went to beat that cub to let it know <laughs> uh, it didn't need to be part of her crew. Yeah. And when she did, she beat it with her paws, not claws, which I thought was interesting. So more of a loving touch as opposed to... She could have really tore she, that thing apart. She could have tore it apart, but she chose to not use the claws in that case, just her mm. paws. I thought that was an interesting thing to see. And it is uh, always interesting to watch bears navigate how... <laughs> uh, it can be sometimes awkward to see that they, you know, they have these pointy things at the end of their, their paws. How do they sort of get around poking and scratching things well, unnecessarily? Well, watching them try to hold on to a fish is really fascinating because they don't quite have the ability to fully hold on to it so they'll often take it and fish are super slippery they anybody are. who's handled one knows they're covered with a, a layer of slime yeah and they'll often take that fish and either plant it on a rock and hold it under their paw or they'll put it on their forepaw and kind of hold it there and and then reach down and bite the salmon that way one of my other favorites i've seen this particularly with cubs recently but they'll put the salmon in between their paws and um, eat it like almost like they're praying <laughs> like bedtime prayers you'll see these little cubs with the salmon in between their their paws with the claws sticking out 
Uh, and it's worth noting, yeah, these are not like cats. The claws are not retractable. No. They're out all, all the time. The time. Um, but they are, again, very, very useful tools, uh, particularly for obtaining food. That's why they've evolved into what they are now. Uh, so, yes, they can be a little bit cumbersome when uh, trying to hold on to fish when you're eating it, but they can be useful for tearing, sort of slicing mm -hmm. these salmon. Um, again, grasping those salmon when you're fishing, incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. But the salmon are only going to be in this river for a short period of the year. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, bears are consuming other food sources. Um, and some of that, particularly if it's a bear out on the coast, they might be doing a lot of digging on the beach That's for right. things like clams. And, and I'm even then, using that claw to open that clam. Exactly. Uh, so they'll, particularly, again, on the forepaws with the longer claws, they'll use these uh, claws, they'll bunch them together, and they'll dig. And it's very impressive to see how effectively these bears can dig. We had one bear in particular, 854, mm -hmm. that actually got her nickname for digging. Divot, yeah. Yes. Uh, digging divots in the gravel sandbars looking for food items. Absolutely. They, they will dig, uh, particularly if they smell something tasty uh, or interesting. Uh, sometimes on the beach here in Brooks Camp, if somebody happens to spill uh, some gasoline or something like that, bears will dig them up. And when they're in a field, you can go and find a half acre plot completely dug up by a bear going for mm. grubs or roots and really looks like a rotor tiller's been through there. Absolutely. Uh, so it's a really effective tool for, for digging. And as you mentioned, Russ, particularly bears out on the Katmai coast, uh, they're very big into seafood. Uh, so clams, once they get these clams, they're still that hard shell. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they have to learn to use their claws to pry the seafood, the shellfish, open. Right. Uh, and it's quite remarkable to see them use those claws as a tool in that way. It's it pretty sure fascinating. Um, but as useful as tools are, as they are, they are also used for defense uh, occasionally. Uh, you mean like Wolverine and X-Men? Pretty much. They basically <laughs> have like knives or daggers on the ends of their knuckles, essentially. Uh, and as we've seen quite a bit on the cams this year already, there's, there are daily struggles for dominance here at Brooks Falls. Mm -hmm. And that is one powerful tool that the bears have. Um, you look at There's a bear. A, no, I'll, yeah. You can't find a bear out here that's an adult male, particularly without marks all over the side of its net. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about bears like eight, five, six currently. Mm -hmm. Who on it would be at the right side of his neck. He just has gaping scratch marks, mm -hmm. um, and those are from these encounters with other bears as they take their claws and just scrape them across each other. Yeah. Because again, the, with adult male, these claws are going to be, you know, two to three inches at, at peak. And yes, they're sharp and they're thick and powerful and strong, but imagine all the weight behind that. A bro uh, an adult brown bear could easily be a thousand pounds. So you imagine the momentum and the force as one of these bears, if they really wind it up, you know, like a baseball pitcher, and one symbol of that is that shoulder hump. Yeah. That shoulder hump is all muscle that's mm -hmm. being used. That They use that muscle in their digging process. So you're right. There is a lot of power behind the Those swing spots. of a bear paw. Even these sub-adults, when they're playing, you think about it. If a, a human adult were in that situation, even that l small bear could do some damage. Absolutely. You know, we often think of these sub-adults or bear cubs as being cute and sort of clumsy and adorable they're so, you know the size of a saint bernard when you see them up close uh <laughs> when you see them on the trail suddenly they're a big bear <laughs> they're a big deal and they could easily you know take down a human if they so chose and fortunately brown bears don't do that uh the often, vast yeah. majority of the right. time right uh you know whenever you hear about those encounters it's usually because a bear was surprised right uh but these claws another thing i find interesting russ is that they can be different colors we often think of them just sort of being like a black color, but they can really run the spectrum from almost pitch black to a chocolate brown to a light brown and even a bright white. 
You know, we look at, uh, and they do help us identify bears. Yes. Sometimes we can look at bears and we use various factors mm -hmm. to identify them, whether it's the shape of their ears, the shape of their snout, a uh, scar that is prominent and lifelong or lefty missing his ear. He's yes. been chewed off. But claws also <laughs> do help us in identification. Uh, probably the bear people see the most right now around camp. Uh, is 435, whom we yes. call Holly. But you get it, the lower river, yeah. Yeah, and people will see her a good bit, and she's got really white claws. Like, they stand out, and you can identify her if you knew her coat color. Even if it's changed, her claw color gives her away. But yeah. there's one bear, and I can't think of her number at the moment, but her nickname is Sarah. 477. Thank you. 477. Her claws outdo holly by far i mean her claws are pearl white it is quite astounding and so she's got a dark coat yeah we're sort of you look at the brooks river and it's often very muted colors you know these bears are very shades of brownish grayish and all of a sudden you see four, a bear like 477 sarah with these white claws like you he almost hear like a gling gling <laughs> like a sparkle yes when you see her claws they're almost eerily white it's, yeah, it'd be like somebody getting onto the subway train wearing something really loud and bright. You can't help but notice you can, it. Yeah, um, and so these claws can actually be all sorts of colors. Um, and it's worth noting that they can change color over the course of a bear's lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, probably less likely to change within the course of a season. They won't change like uh, fur color will, right. you know, from spring to fall. But uh, if you look at some older photos, I think of Bear 435, nicknamed Holly, mm -hmm. when she's younger, I believe she did have some darker claws. Uh, they were brown, and then the older she got, they tended to lighten up, lighten up, get a little bit more white. So they're not always definitive in identification, but they, they do help. Yeah, one of the many tools in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of our toolbox, we talked about paws, we talked about the claws that adorn them. Should we talk about teeth? We definitely should when yeah. we're talking about a bear. All right. They have uh, impressive teeth. Quite to impressive. Say the least. Um, so this is a skull of a grizzly bear or a brown bear, Ursus arctos. Um, this is probably going to be a younger bear. Um, but their teeth are very well adapted uh, and can tell us a lot about what these animals are eating. Um, so in the front there, we have these incisors. Uh, first of all, bears have about uh, 42 teeth, hmm, which is more than the us. exactly. Uh, humans have about 32 teeth, uh, and 42 is the number that a dog has as well. So they have the same number of teeth as a household dog, for example, uh, but they're going to be quite a bit larger, as you would guess. Um, so in the front here, I'm going to put one of these down. They have these incisors. Uh, they're going to have about 12 of these incisors. And these are great for slicing, particularly the, the salmon, uh, slicing, cutting mm -hmm. the salmon that they're eating, the meat. But then, right next to them, they have these massive, yeah, you want to hold this one, sure. Ranger Russ? These massive incisors. And then when you think about menacing sort of looking teeth, mm -hmm. this is going to be it. We think of, you know, in the popular imagination, these bare fangs. That's what we're talking about here. Um, and these are going to be more common with carnivores, uh, meat eaters. And they're used for things like ripping away chunks of flesh. Um, they can do that. And photographers will be very familiar when they're trying to get that iconic shot of the bear uh, catching fish yep. when they're standing on the lip. This is what they want to see. You want to see the canine just about to grab that fish. That's what people are going for. Yeah. They really stand out. So these canines... Um, are actually, though, as uh, stunning as they look and scary as they may appear, are abnormally large for a bear that is this omnivorous. Mm -hmm. um, again, you'll see this in a lot of other carnivores, but the bear's diet is not exclusively meat. They eat a lot of berries and sedges and other things like that. And especially in places uh, in the interior yeah. away from the coast, you have bears, say, in uh, Denali yeah. or bears in a place like Yellowstone. They're eating a lot of vegetation. Right. They take opportunities to get meat when they can, but so much of their diet is veg vegetarian. Yeah, and so it is surprising that these, these canines are that large. Um, but they do serve another purpose as well in sort of 
uh, preemptive defense, sort of oh. uh, scaring folks off, other bears, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you snarl, show your how, show your teeth. Yeah, um, it can be sort of a warning mm -hmm. as well. Um, these are these sort of canines in the front of the bear's mouth, but as we talked about, as you mentioned, they're eating a lot of other things, a lot of plants, a Vegetation, lot of sedges, grasses, sedges, berries, and that's where these molars come into play. Um, they're going to have these molars in the back here, uh, what we call bunidont. They're going to have four cusps on top. Uh, and contrast that with a dog that only has two. Bear have four of these cusps on molars, sort of peaks. And it gives them a really rough surface. Mm -hmm. So you think about if the bears are eating really sort of tough, fibrous plants, mm -hmm. twigs or things like that, they're chewing on for whatever reason, this is really going to help them grind. Yep. That's where these molars come to place. Um, so we have these incisors, the canines, and the molars. So. And think about what an advantage those are. And yet, it's one of the disadvantages for an older bear. Yes. You know? Older bears will begin to lose their teeth. And it can make fishing a little bit more challenging. Absolutely. I'm thinking particularly uh, a bear that our webcam viewers know quite well, 480 Otis. Mm -hmm. uh, he is one of our older male, oldest male bear, I believe, oldest on the Brooks one River. We know of, yeah. And he's actually missing, uh, I believe, one of his canines. Mm -hmm. So, again, those are used for s sort of tearing flesh. Right. He will, you will see him eat salmon more with his molars. Like, he'll sort of throw it back and have to it's grind it that way. It's much more laborious for him to get that skin off. It really is. Or 410, our oldest female bear, yes. 29 this year. She just kind of, you see her chomping <laughs> it with her molars and just throwing it down her gullet. Right. With, without even, really even stripping the skin anymore. So that's one of the things that older bears have to overcome is the loss of some critical teeth. Yeah, you'll see her sort of throw throw the fish back. I also think of a couple of years ago, Bear 814 mm -hmm. Lurch, who uh, was, a, from some perspectives, a very scary looking bear. Uh, he was a little beat up, uh, one of the more dominant bears on the river. Uh, he was missing some teeth. Uh, there's some photographs out there where it looks like he's missing one of his canines, some of the incisors in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, after a lifetime of use, these teeth get worn down, yep. and bears are not brushing twice a day. Mm. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine uh, they get worn down and beat up relatively quickly. Yeah, it's all part of the cycle of life. Yeah. So through their claws, their paws, and these wonderful pointy teeth, bears have a whole bunch of tools that they can use. Mm -hmm. um, they are pretty brilliantly adapted. Right. Um, and when you're watching the cams, it's you know fun to focus on a distance from a distance at sort of the, you know, how furry they are, oh, how many fish, fish did they catch today. But pay attention to those claws, to mm -hmm. those teeth, and just see how they use them. It's really fascinating to watch on a daily basis how they're using those tools, again, in their toolbox. It really is, and, and especially the camera on the lower part of the falls platform, uh, sometimes bears are coming right into that camera view, and you may get some really good close shots of those claws. Yeah. Fun to watch, certainly. So, Russ, we are about uh, halfway through okay. um, this broadcast. Time for questions. Should we take some questions? Well, well, let's do it. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe hand this over to you okay. if you want to read them, pick it, some out. Yeah. Is there a correlation between bear paws size and their overall size of the bear? So the paws yeah. versus the size of the bear. Uh, correlation? Yeah, I would say so, yes. Uh, bears... They're not going to become grossly disproportionate through natural means. So uh, if a bear is going to be growing, its paws will also grow. So they may put on weight, you know, seasonally. Their bellies might get larger. Mm -hmm. But as a bear grows in size, as will its footprint. Think about you as you grow up. The older you get, often uh, when you're, you're a teenager, your feet will get larger as well. Same deal. You know, I think about it even when I'm walking down the road here to work in the morning yeah. and I see bear prints on the road, I'm often using that to assess <laughs> how big that bear is and who I might run into how on the trail. How recently was it there? Yes, it does. You really <laughs> begin to learn that. You're like, yeah. well, those tracks are very wet. That bear is just gone. It's ahead of me, and you might see it dip off into the woods, but I'm assessing those bear prints all along the way to know who's around me. Right. It really helps. Absolutely. You know? So, 
do bear claws continue to grow throughout their lifetime? And there's a second part of this question. Do they sharpen their claws like a cat might? Hmm. Okay. So the claws will... They're, it's not as if they will, like your fingernails, mm -hmm. they'll keep growing until forever. Mm -hmm. uh, they do sort of like dog claws, uh, although we might clip some of our dog, our pet dog's claws. They're not, they're going to stop at a certain point. Mm -hmm. They will reach a max, um, but they will regenerate. So if one gets damaged or, you know, uh, shortened by some mean, it will grow back. Um, and the second part of that question was, do uh, they sharpen them? Yeah, like lions and leopards would yeah. sharpen theirs. Uh, you will notice, yeah, bears will have scratch trees. They will sort of scratch things, um, but they won't sort of be sharpening them like knives necessarily. But you will see, yeah, on trees, they'll scratch them. Whether that's explicitly to sharpen them, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, but it, uh, yeah, we'll have to ask them. <laughs> there are so many things we'd love to know about bears right. that we do through observation. Yeah. But the science is, is hard to get sometimes, especially right. things like hibernation where we, we don't always get to observe them as closely yeah. as we might like. I just learned Sarah 477 was apparently seen this morning at the falls. Oh, was she? So people did get to see those white Those claws. pearly white uh, People claws. are wondering, is that a recessive gene that causes that? Do we know that? I could not venture a guess as to the genetics behind the claws. Um, I've actually asked this question of one of our biologists here, uh, Ranger Michael Saxton, and he was unsure as to specifically what does, what gives the claws their color. Um, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. Okay, great, yeah. great. I'm sure there is a genetic component. Uh, how it exactly it translates, I'm not sure. That'd be something to, for us to study for. Absolutely. So, we know about Otis uh, missing canine. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other bears that we know of right now that we're going to see at the falls that are missing major missing teeth? teeth. I'm trying to think through that one so too. I haven't gotten close enough often to check, <laughs> um, but I almost assuredly, particularly mm -hmm. with our older bears. So you're thinking about bears that are slowly getting up there in age. Otis is obviously a prime example. Uh, 856 is getting older. 435 is in her early 20s as well, 402. Uh, that would be something to look for. Um, particularly as these bears get older, you would expect to see those teeth wearing down. Uh, they could get cavities, you know, they could lose teeth. Um, and one way to tell if they're having teeth issues is how they are eating those salmon. Uh, if they look like they're having trouble, that might be indicative that they might be missing one of those canines, one of those incisors. Mm -hmm. There might be some issues causing them pain might be something to look for but almost assuredly uh, particularly with those older bears they're gonna be missing some okay mm -hmm. so we have uh, a viewer who's interested in this it's a it's an interesting question we've seen in the wild occasionally there's an animal with three legs uh, you know your 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 neighbor's dog they call tripod you know, <laughs> has three legs and it's right. able to survive yeah if a bear had only three legs what would it how would that affect its survival three three legs it three sounds legs. like it's missing a leg for some reason so we have a bear that's a stool um <laughs> that would seriously uh i would say diminish its chances for survival uh because you think about what a bear does on a daily basis they move quite a bit mm -hmm. uh bears can move dozens and dozens of miles in a single day if they want um and then they're also standing in the river um, with this river current, and we talked about how much stability having four paws, mm -hmm. four points of contact, gives you. They're not going to be able to fish as effectively if it has three legs. It would not be able to run uh, as effectively as it would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to be looking too good for that bear, I would say. You know, I would agree. I think a bear, we've even seen a bear that has a severe paw injury. Yes. Uh, last year, 634 Popeye had an injured paw. Yeah. Affected him pretty deeply. And I believe that one was from an encounter with bear 32, I think. So, yeah. in, a, in a wounded in a fight, if, if a bear just didn't have that paw at all, uh, I think it would definitely affect their survival. And you, uh, you have don't to imagine even, it would be a target for other bear. bears at that point as well. That's right. It would be, it would be a tough road to hoe to only have three three legs and as in, a bear. Interesting hypothetical, certainly. It is, yeah. And we, uh, we have an, uh, another interesting question. Yeah. This is a little bit out there, but we'll, we'll take them. <laughs> All right. Uh, 775 Lefty yep. and 480 Otis spent hours in the water. 
You know how a human, when they're in the bathtub... Get pruny? Yeah. Do, do bears... Get I, <laughs> do, like do bears get pruny <laughs> sitting in the river? <laughs> uh, I would say uh, not the same way that we humans would, mm -hmm. uh, just because their skin is different. Um, as we talked about, on these paws, this skin is thick and it is calloused and it is, has the consistency of sandpaper. Yeah. So while we sort of have these blood vessels very close to the skin and our skin is relatively thin, theirs is not going to be that way. I have seen some country boys in Alabama <laughs> that run around barefoot all summer that get pretty thick skin yeah, too. Yeah, you know? their heels getting kind of <laughs> tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, bears, uh, they're, they've built up a nice callus um, and they would have... Uh, adapted over time to to being in the water um, yeah, and they don't get really pruny no i mean part of this water is cold this water is probably in the 50s yes. uh and so if these, not colder yeah if not colder and these bears have also a couple layers of fur like a really small thin layer covered by an another layer so they can stand in that water for hours on end not only are they not wrinkling up like us but we would start to oh have my, hypothermia within seconds yeah. absolutely so their ability to stay in the water is really something so we have someone who i guess is seen on the webcam holly before mm -hmm. she nurses her cubs will sometimes dig a hole a little bit and then get yeah. on her back have you seen other other sows do that um i have not seen that specifically in regards to nursing um so and that's probably like a comfort thing right um 435 holly would dig a hole just a little bit more protection and then again particularly later in the season they have quite quite the girth mm -hmm. uh quite the belly uh and so it adds a little bit more of a a recess for them to uh lean back in and we do see uh belly holes a lot the the boars and the sows they'll get so big their stomachs are so big they'll they'll be kind of dragging on the ground so they'll dig a big hole so when they lay down there's a room for their a belly. Little bit, a little bit more comfort if they can put their belly into that hole and there might be a um, sort of a mental comfort thing as well an emotional comfort a little bit more protected if you're down underground uh not completely it exposed does seem like i've seen some other sows when they're laying down to feed their mm -hmm. cubs they do seem to have their back up a little bit on mm. on some sand so it does seem like they do like having a little bit of support there back support yeah <laughs> uh let's see the, okay we're gonna get a little deeper and we're gonna go into like hibernation this is an okay. interesting question at a quick glance we'll see do bears claws slow or stop growing during hibernation that is a fascinating question and I would say that it, most of their, bo their body proce bo processes, excuse me, do slow down in hibernation. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to believe that that would be any different. Their breathing, their heart rates, their metabolism, their digestive system, all of that slows down during hibernation. So just using those clues, I would say that their claw regeneration and growth probably slows down as well. Okay, I yeah. have another question here that, that I like this one. Are there, because we talked about prints and looking at them yeah. on the road. Are there any bear prints you see and you know which bear they belong to? Like it has missing a claw <laughs> or has a scar, et cetera. Right, so this is something we've <laughs> joked about as rangers, you know, because visitors will often ask us, you know, for a bear at, you know, 500 yards, which bear is that? And it's, it's really hard to tell a lot of the times. Uh, so we often will joke about being able to identify them from their paw prints. I don't know anyone who's that good. Um, it's certainly possible, um, but there's just too many bears around here of similar size, um, and it's not like they have fingerprints we can test necessarily. Yeah, and I can't say I know, like looking at it saying, this is that bear, but I did uh, a couple weeks ago walking along Lake Brooks. Yeah. There was a prince, and I was like, oh, I wonder what the story is, and I saw one large print, and I just saw one small print really small and i did say to myself hey this looks like 132 it's wasau it's one cub so yep. we know well there may be another now but we know that she has that one cub and sure enough i ran into her yeah on the road so in that way but i can't say that i looked at the print and said that is one so it'd be really print. hard to look at the individual 
prints, mm -hmm. but by maybe by the number of sets of prints mm -hmm. that you can see, you can tell how big a particular group is. Mm -hmm. And then thinking of the bears that we have here in the area, okay, there are three sets of cub prints here, smaller prints. It could be one of these two bears or something right. like that. So we can narrow it down yeah. a bit. Uh, that's always, it, it is a little bit of fun guessing game. Like, oh, I yeah. wonder who, who passed through in front of my cabin this morning. <laughs> that's know. right. Okay, when bears fight, Mm -hmm. Is it the teeth or the claws which are more likely to cause injury to another bear? Yeah. Hmm. I would guess most frequently when we see these wounds, it's probably going to be claw marks more than anything else, simply because they have you know, th these arms that can come out, these legs with the claws on the end, um, to make contact with the other bear. Whereas the teeth, it's harder for them to get in close and bite down. You will see that certainly from time to time, but it's more going to be about the claws. If they do uh, latch with their teeth, uh, there's going to be more damage. I Absolutely. Would, at that point, if it's actually coming to teeth on the other bear, they are serious about inflicting injury. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, so teeth would be devastating. And I have two thoughts on this. One is a lot of times when you see bears sort of standing off and they're, they're often just, it's bluster and bluffing. Mm -hmm. And what, what will they do? They'll sort of open their mouth and will show their teeth. They'll vocalize, but it's more of a threat. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'm also thinking of some of the more famous bear fights or interactions we've seen here on, on the camps. And I'm thinking of a number of years ago, a uh, nick bear nicknamed Ted, 189. Mm -hmm. He got in a pretty famous tussle, and a slice of a claw sliced off a piece of skin, and oh, it was yeah, just sort of a flap, flap hanging there. Uh, but that is really indicative of the damage that these claws can do. And it also shows second. just how well these bears heal. Yes. Because imagine a huge flap of skin like that, and that bear apparently within a week or so was in very good shape. And he was around for a number of years after that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things I find interesting when I look at paw prints is trying to figure out sometimes if it's the left or the right. Yeah. You know, because they have a digit that sort of sets a little bit yeah. apart. But the question I have kind of related to that, and you can talk yeah. about that first, and then uh, do they use that? digit like a thumb that's the question yes uh no <laughs> uh, so they do not have opposable thumbs um but yes so they do have uh, we were talking about how uh, skinned or decomposing paws can look like human hands mm -hmm. they do have five digits but uh they don't have one lower like we do our thumb is lower on our hand mm -hmm. these theirs are sort of all going to be in relatively an even row um but uh, yes, and that is one of the reasons why they can look like human hands, is mm -hmm. they have five. But they will not be able to use it like we would uh, in grasping things. Yeah, and I believe the thumb would be more like what we would call the thumb would be their outer, yes. outer uh, yeah. digit. Yeah, and you can tell which side of the bear it came from uh, by the shape. So this would be the one on this right. side. So have you, uh, let's see, have you ever found a bear claw or tooth from a bear at Brooks? I have not. Hmm. Um, so, and there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is this is a very heavily populated area as far as Bush, Alaska goes. Mm -hmm. You get pretty heavy visitation during the days, particularly in peak season. It wouldn't last very long. Um, even though people are supposed to leave things in place, it probably would have been scooped up by bi bi biologists, excuse me, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, there are two instances I can think of where we have had uh, bears their carcasses around and we as a park have taken in those bodies or carcasses at the end of the season right. uh, to add to our museum collection mm -hmm. or for educational purposes. Uh, there, I believe 868, um, his backbone was on the beach for quite a while. That's we right. now have that in his skull um, in King Salmon uh, near our visitor center. We have that. Um, and Tundra is a bear that our bear cam viewers might recognize. Uh, we now use her skull for educational purposes as well. Mm -hmm. um, and as we're talking about this, I know a lot of webcam viewers might be thinking of a spring cub that passed away several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. The body of that spring cub is still located near the platform here, mm -hmm. uh, the Riffles platform on the ground. 
we're going to leave it there, let nature take, take its course as long as possible, but it's possible at the end of the season, if those bones are still there, we might use them for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never heard of anyone just finding bare bones no, I haven't either. necessarily. I know bones of what we think is 814 lurch was found behind the lower viewing platform uh, a number of years ago. But other than that, I can't really think. It's not a daily occurrence, certainly. Do bears have a dominant paw? This viewer noted bears, for, for some reason this viewer says it seems that most often they use their right paw yeah. to hold their fish against their left leg while eating. Yeah. Which you do see a lot of bears doing that. Uh, I have no reason to think that they wouldn't have a preferred limb. You know, they get in their habits. They have their preferred method of fishing. I don't know why they wouldn't. Um, yeah, I bet bears have a, a preferred digit, I would suppose. Yeah. Let's, and let's talk about 409 for a minute, Andrew. Yes. 409, when she's on the falls, we often see her hold a paw up. Yes. Right? So the, the viewer's question is, is that a learned behavior, or is that something that's uh, just genetic it's, in her? Or? It is probably a, a learned sort of like a tick, almost. Mm -hmm. She would be, it's just something, it's a habit, you know, we see these bears have their own sort of personalities come through in their actions. I think of 775 Lefty and a sort of trademark head bounce. <laughs> yep. That's one of her things. It's just her style of fishing, almost like she's ready to pounce. I think she gets, of all the bears I've observed, mm -hmm. she can get really impatient yes. when the fish are not jumping. And she kind of starts pawing at the water, and I yeah. think that... That paw is just always ready. And I did watch some sub-adults that were not necessarily her offspring. And I noticed a sub-adult walk up there watching her for a while. And I yeah. saw that sub-adult raise its, its paw. paw. And so, I have to say, I was like, is this sub-adult learning this behavior from her? Bears, so I would say learned more than right. just genetic. And bears you know, learn through observation. So mm -hmm. if they see other bears uh, who are quite successful, uh, exhibiting certain behavior, they mm -hmm. would try to emulate that as well. Um, but yeah, there's not really a, probably a lot of utility in what she does. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably just more of sort of a tick or right. a, a habit. But yeah, you will see her standing, again, precariously close to that edge, and she did fall over the lip of the falls a few weeks ago, but she'll have that paw raised, almost like she's just ready to, to jump. Let's take a last question from yeah. the viewer, Andrew. And uh, this one is more about the salmon spawning, and the question is, sure. these salmon that we see jumping the falls, mm -hmm. are they going to other tributaries of Lake Brooks, or are they just going to the top of the river? Where are they going? Yeah, so this is not the end of their journey. This is just one obstacle close to the end, but it's not the finish line by any stretch of imagination. So salmon are going to be looking to spawn in shallow uh, slow moving streams mm -hmm. and so where a lot of these salmon are salmon are going to be going is are into the streams that feed into lake brooks which is the headwaters for the brooks river here mm -hmm. so they're going to jump the falls and if they're successful continue up into lake brooks maybe take a breather at what they just accomplished uh, and then they're going to sort of migrate into these smaller streams that feed into that relatively large lake are there going to be other bears up there there will be other bears, certainly. Later in the season, perhaps? L later in the season. And uh, August is known as a slow time here on the Brooks River. What some of these bears will do is sort of follow the salmon. As these salmon continue up to their spawning grounds, some of these bears might follow them. That's right. When it gets quiet here, we may find them at uh, other tributaries yeah. around the park. Yeah, they, and they'll move. Viewers of our underwater cam might notice that some of these salmon are already beginning to put on their spawning colors. They are. Some of these salmon are already turning red with that green head. Mm -hmm. They're changing color from that silver, mm -hmm. uh, dark color. Uh, so the process is beginning, yep. but there's still a lot of fish on the way. Uh, I believe this last Saturday, July 14th, over a million salmon entered Katmai National Park's watersheds Amazing. on Saturday alone. 1 million salmon. And so in a few days, this place should be packed with salmon. It should, yeah, the stream should continue. Uh, salmon can travel about 30 miles in a day. And so if they came in in the Knack Knack River, they should be here uh, probably yesterday or today. And of course, some of the salmon don't come up to the falls. No. Nope. We know that some actually stay uh, from Knack Knack Lake just at the beginning of the Brooks River mm -hmm. there at the mouth. And then some will just stay in Knack Knack Lake and, of course, go to other tributaries of Knack, right. Knack Of which there are many, the sort of fresh water system we have mm -hmm. here uh, that can go a number of places. So not all of them are going to be coming up here to Brooks Falls, certainly.
Well, Andrew, though, that was a great uh, set of questions we got yeah. today, and uh, appreciate all the information that you brought to us. Uh, well researched and. Uh, great information. I hope people learn some new things today. Absolutely. And we will have some other live chats coming up in the next week or so, mm -hmm. if you want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah. The next one will be on the kind of the history of human-bear interaction, uh, both throughout the centuries and how we react with them today. And that's scheduled for early next week. That's right. I believe on Monday. That's right. And then next Thursday, about a week from today, we're going to be talking about the ins and outs of bears, bears digestive systems. Oh, the ins and outs. So, <laughs> uh, stay tuned for that next week uh, on The Bear Cam. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is, again, The Bear Cam brought to you by Explore.org. My name is Andrew. My name is Russ. Thanks for joining us.